turn it on to silent or vibrate. We have seven members present. The committee will come to order. The clerk will call the roll. Here. Representative Betzel? Here. Representative Boyd? Here. Representative Easterbuck? Here. Representative Hollis? Representative Keel? Representative Lawrence? Here. Representative Shaver? Present. Representative Stahigan? We have a quorum. Thank you. I don't see. Mr. Bracey has asked that his bill be carried over, House Bill 303. With that, the esteemed and distinguished Senator uh, Singleton for Senate Bill 159. Mr. Chairman and committee, thank you all for allowing me to be before you today. Uh, that bill that he got carried over is simply because we got the Senate bill coming here yep. now. It basically does the same thing. This is a bill for Alabama State University that deals with uh, virtual meetings. And you know, uh, during the pandemic, a lot of universities have to do so. But what is a little bit different and unique about this one is, is that most of the virtual meeting has to have someone in the room. And this bill will give a ASU and, and, and Alabama A&M both the ability to have their virtual meeting with only making a quorum on the virtual process, not that they have to have four people in the room. And I think that this will help the university because a lot of our board members come from out of state having to travel in. So sometimes having four people in the room is going to be difficult. So we, i like to ask the board for a considerable favorable report for this. Ladies and gentlemen, this bill basically puts Alabama State University and Alabama A&M on the same playing field as the other colleges. It's just air, fairness and equity. Do I have a motion from Mr. Lawrence? Motion, sir. Motion to give the bill a favorable report, seconded by Representative Shiver. All in favor of giving Senate Bill 159 a favorable report, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Ayes have it. Senate Bill 159 is passed. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Senator. Chairman. Thank you, committee. House Bill 350. This is a very important, hard-hitting piece of legislation. <clears throat> this is what brought the crowd, Mr. Allen. Mr. Chairman? This is what brought the crowd I'm, here I today. I figured this is what brought the crowd. You know, I have a way of with these bills sometimes in the House of uh, garnering uh, some attention. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for hearing um, HB 350. It's uh, a bill to designate the peanut as the official state legume of Alabama. And uh, today the Alabama peanut producers were around the state capitol and in the state house and we got to enjoy some fried peanut butter sandwiches. And they were very good. Uh, but Alabama ranks second in the nation in peanut production. Peanuts are a $211 million industry in the state. More than 900 farm families grew peanuts on 183,000 acres in 33 counties across the state in 2021. The majority of peanuts grown in the state are used to make peanut butter. Peanut butter is one of the most requested items at food banks. It is shelf stable, versatile, and affordable. Dothan, Alabama is considered the peanut capital of the world because over half the peanuts produced in the nation are grown within a hundred mile radius of Dothan, Alabama. Do we have a motion? By uh, Mr. Kuehl? Huh? Yeah. Did, did you have a question, Ms. Boyd, or are you making a motion? Oh, I'm going to say this. I'm old enough to remember Dr. George Washington Carver, who took the peanut over 365, what recognition or what would this give to him in at all, or would you consider? I mean, that's... No, it's very important of what he did Tuskegee for peanut butter at Tuskegee and University. The and the potato, what, sweet potato? Yeah, uh -huh. and we heard about the sweet potato last year. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, but this bill doesn't include Mr. Mr. Carver. Why not? Talking about peanuts and the original person who started it well, at okay. Tuskegee. You even mentioned the old man in it all. You need, you need, need to listen. I'm going to remind the members, <laughs> turn on your microphones. Uh -huh. People are watching us remotely. Turn your microphones on, please, and speak into them so people can hear. Yes, Ms. Hollis. Yeah, being a Tuskegee Institute slash university grad, all right. I would love to see an acknowledgement of okay. Dr. Carver in that bill. Okay. Somewhere, even as amended or whatever. Okay, we can certainly work on that and talk about that. I want you to just tell me that. Okay. We want it, no, we want it done. Okay. Right. I understand. 
We can amend it as a community right now at this I, moment. Is somebody from LSA here? Because I don't know how you would put it's the legume. I, I don't know how we how you add this official as the state official bill. I mean, the bill for the state legume. I don't know how we do that in this. I, I know how we can do it if you want to do it. They carry it over to the next time and give them a chance to do now, it. I, I, can we put in a, we can we put a floor amendment on it. But we have to get it drafted through LSA. Right. Yes, we so. do. I guess the question is, are you open to sure. that friendly amendment? Sure. Is the question. Sure. Okay. So you know everybody watching you. Sure. Okay. All right. With, with that, do we have a motion to give the bill a favorable report by Mr. Shiver? Seconded by Mr. Eastbrook. All in favor of giving HB 350 a favorable report, say aye. aye. All opposed? Ayes have it. House Bill 350 is given favorable no, report. I, Mr. Chairman, I thought we were on the point of what? considering something when we vote this out of here that's it unless he's willing to no we're, we're going to put an amendment on the floor well, yeah we're going i to. didn't hear that yeah I yeah we're going to, to. Yeah. i am so sorry thank you for that okay thank you mr chairman thank you okay now pending before us is house bill 361 by mr chestnut and the companion bill senate bill 147 by senator orr ladies and gentlemen We've got some amendments, that, and let me let me just cut to the chase and explain. We're going the first amendment going on HB 361 is an amendment that will make it identical to the engrossed version of SB 147. Okay, it'll be identical to SB 147 when we adopt the first amendment. Then we have two other amendments we're going to put on this bill, and then we get when we get to the Senate bill. We're going to add those two amendments to the Senate bill, so, so both bills today will read identical to each other. That way we have a House bill and a Senate bill we can pass out of here and send to the floor, and we can choose whichever one for the open meetings. Any questions, Mr. Chestnut? That's all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, where are the, you got the amendments? I've, I've got the amendments. Yeah, okay. I mean, I've got them here. Trust me, I've read them. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, I know it's maybe the wrong page, but we passed a lot of Senate bills, and I want to know how many House bills passed up there in the Senate. Uh, that's that's a question for the Speaker McCutcheon. I know. I mean, that's what I'm asking. <laughs> I want to be. I mean, we passed every yeah, bill we passed, but it seemed to be a Senate bill. I mean, even on the floor, you know. And so I'm I'm all for that, but you know, all passed, they all be passed in House bills similar to in the House in the Senate. So I need to ask, I want to know how many Senate bills they pay, the House bill they pay, them in the Senate. <laughs> Besides the budget, I see the budget chair being here. Besides the budget, they rate on right now. So, so I just want to know. We, we, Mr. Rogers. Once you pay that Senate bill, it's old. You, you and I have been here a long time, and this has been a problem since since yeah. I got here. Now, you were here way before me. It's been a problem before they did, too. So, 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 so yeah. it's an ongoing problem. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, I don't Lord. make the rules. I live by them. Yes, Miss Boyd. All right, so House of Law and House of Common, but yeah. we're going to come with something. All right, uh, Mr. Chestnut, I believe you have your first amendment to House Bill 361 is amendment. If you're looking at your amendment, it's the two-page amendment, and it's the number on that amendment will be 22297. I've got those, Mr. Chairman. Okay. It's uh, the LSA number is 217943-1, and that's Amendment 1. Wait a minute. Which one you got? What's the amendment number? Um, it's two one seven nine four three dash one. Okay, I got that one. Okay, that's same. I got the same one. I was reading the wrong number. Sorry. That's the amendment number right there, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And this, right, I'm sorry. This removes the public quote participation language. Is what uh, is what this does. It basically allows them to participate in a meeting in the same to the same extent that they would be able to participate at a physical meeting. Cast votes. Wow. They'll be cast a vote. Yeah. There any further discussion on the First Amendment to House Bill 361? This amendment here puts it so it reads identical to the bill that, that, that's engrossed out of the Senate. Do I have a motion? Oh. Bed slow second. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Oh, we've got three amendments, and I hate to do this to my fellow Representative Chestnut, but am I seeing three amendments? Why didn't we bring a substitute with 
all these amendments we're going to deal with this time. What was I, I, the objection I, of not bringing a substitute? Because this is the, the fastest. pages to the. Thing. This is the fastest way to make this bill read identical to the engrossed version of the Senate bill. You, oh, I'm sorry. I got a coup. You're the chairman. Yeah. We're just doing the thing right now that we were trying to stop. We're perpetuating this. I think it needs to be carried over and bring a substitute for all of these pages at this time. And I hate to be so dictatorial in it, but it's a matter of, he's an attorney, he's laughing at me there because he understands well what I'm saying. Yes, Ms. Hollis. Um, I, I do understand the bill, and I understand that what you're trying to do is uh, have virtual meetings of different organizations that cannot with also having the public to view as they have these virtual me uh, meetings. Is this correct? That's correct. Okay, and, and I think, and, and not going against you, Dr. Boyd, but I, I, I do think that this is a need that that we do need because, you know, there are some boys that cannot meet because they cannot meet virtually. And in the past, there's been uh, problems with having quorums and things like that due to uh, COVID. Am I correct, uh, That's correct. Representative? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm, I'm for the bill because it's a need. Yeah. So at the appropriate time, uh, Mr. Chair, I vote that we have a favorable vote with this bill. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, what Ms. Hollis is exactly right. The COVID brought this problem to the forefront, but I probably have 15 bills right now pending in this committee of people trying to pass their own little bill to do their own little meeting the way they want to do it. And what this bill does is makes it uniform for so many of these different boards, agencies, and commissions to have a uniform way of conducting their meetings virtually rather than have 30 or 40 different laws governing it. We're trying to make it uniform for everybody. Now, Alabama State, we just did their bill because there, there's there's some other problems and that we're having to make exemptions and allow like Alabama State to, because they're on parity now with the other universities. And same thing with A&M. But for the other vast majority of these boards, these city councils and county commissioners and everybody else, we're trying to come up with a uniform way to conduct businesses virtually. Uh, Mr. Yes, Ms. Boyd. My issue is not what the bill does. Not at all. I understand that. My issue is the process of bringing all of this in here without a substitute. That's it. Yes, ma'am. I understand. Well, we can we can carry over HB uh, 361 and just uh, uh, fix SB 147 and adopt it. It does the same thing with just two amendments, mm -hmm. two very short, very very simple amendments. Is that the will of the committee? You want to carry over HB 361 and let's go to SB 147 and put those two little short amendments on it and fix it, send that up? You know, do the same thing, won't it, Miss? Yeah, but it's yeah. just two simple little amendments. Uh-huh, but it would change so, mu uh -huh, so much. What do you want to do, Mr. Chestnut? You're the sponsor. I got a question for you, Mr. Chair. Yes. I mean, why is his bill so, so different with all the I mean, two, How many members you got, about four, three or four? Three or four? Three, three members or four members? There are three on, three. Three on his bill. And two on, uh, on and SB 147. Yeah. So basically the first amendment is to make it identical to 147. And then there are two amendments. So what, what's happened is all of the, um, all of the major um, groups have gotten together, and this is what they, uh, it, it, they, they all agreed on. And so this is... Yeah, we're going to have some uniformity um, in this instead of just having helter skelter with multiple bills that are going in different directions. Well, well the question is, when you get to the floor, you going you going to go to the Senate amendment. You will make it identical, and you going to uh, defer to the Senate bill anyway on, on the floor. So why not just take the Senate bill and make it uh, and do the same thing right here instead of do, going through the process on the floor? Sign with me. All right. Well, you with uh, you want to withdraw uh, HP? As long as we can get it on one of them on the floor. Yeah, three sixty one. Okay. It's, okay. It we're going to withdraw HP one three sixty one, and now we're going to go to Senate Bill one forty seven, which has two amendments. Do you have those, do you, Mr. Keel? Do you have those two amendments? I have okay. not here, Mr. Chairman. Lawrence. Okay. <clears throat> um, now before us is Senate Bill one forty seven. 
And I understand that there are two amendments. Uh, yes. One, the one is um, LSA 2022-22286. Uh, it allows local, <coughs> county, and municipalities to virtually meet um, because that Senate bill originally didn't have that in there. And so that's what it would do there, and it, and it brings in those groups. Uh, it provides that a quorum must be physically present for the local government governing bodies to hold meetings, but allows for members who are absent due to sickness to uh, be allowed to fully participate in the meeting. Why, Matt? Why, Matt? I'm I'm looking at Mr. Chestnut. The numbers. Yes. The 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 numbers we we have up here. Amendment is two one seven nine zero eight dash one. Top left hand corner. I know what I know what you're okay. looking at, but that's unfortunately the number we need to go off of is not the one on the right. Just I got you. I got you. Okay. All right. I see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 The okay. on the left hand corner is what you're going. Yeah. Top okay. left hand corner is, is, it says two one seven nine zero eight dash one. Okay. All right. Yeah. Everybody on that that page that amendment. Yeah. Okay. The Senate Bill one forty seven. And I just explain what what it does. Do we have any questions on the amendment? Do I have a motion? Uh, Ms. Hollis moved. Mr. Rogers second. All in favor of adopting the first amendment to Senate Bill 147 say aye. Aye. All opposed? The amendment is adopted. Now we're to amendment number two to Senate Bill 147. And if you'll look at your paper, it, it's going to be 218-664-1. And this that's is a, a, that's the grandfather clause. That's the grandfather clause brought by the uh, County Commission Association to grandfather in th these other ones. Do we have any questions? So moved. Do I have a motion by Mr. Rogers. Have a second. Second. Second by Ms. Hollis. All in favor of adopting the amendment, amendment number two to SB 147 say aye. Aye. All opposed? Ayes have it. Amendment number two is adopted to the bill. Now we're to the bill as amended. Do I have a motion? Mr. So moved, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask a quick question, Mr. Chairman. Sure, sure, sure. I just want to make sure with all the moving parts that everybody is comfortable with the fact the action we took uh, accomplished exactly what we were trying to. I just want to make sure the sponsor is good and just we have a little clarity on that. Yeah, I'm good. As long as we get it, yeah. get it to the floor and we can get it done, I mean, I'm, I'm good. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm absolutely confident we got, yeah. got the amendments on properly. With that, we have a motion to give Senate Bill 147 a favorable report as amended. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? SB 147 is given favorable report. Mr. Chestnut, you're a very popular man today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lawrence made the motion. Or Rogers, did you make the motion? I made the motion. All right, then I think Mr. Lawrence made the second. We have a chestnut day in state government. <laughs> well, <laughs> all righty. So um, this bill is a uh, bill that was brought last year, it got to the Senate, and we ran out of time. Um, but the bill is a um, bill that deals with the annual audits that are required by municipalities by law under section 11-43-85 of the Alabama Code. And um, the uh, normally every mayor has to have an annual audit, right? And we had a law that was passed a few years ago that allowed the Department of Examiners to get involved when you had a situation where an audit had not been performed for a long period of time or there was some um, issue of fraud or, or some other mismanagement of funds. And so um, what ended up happening is that there was so much uh, traffic coming now to the Department of Examiners. I have someone here from the, the Department, the Executive Director, of uh, questions that need to be a asked. Uh, but this would actually, what this does is for those municipalities that have annual expenditures in excess of $300,000, an annual audit is required. If it's less than $300,000, a biennial audit would be required. 
Uh, but if it, it, the annual expenditures are less than $100,000, then an annual report shall be provided to the Department of Examiners as they would so prescribe. And um, with that being said, I'd like to ask for a favorable report. Did, yeah. did the Examiner of Public Council give you this? Somebody. Uh, where, 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 okay. Okay. Y'all, 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 this is y'all, this is y'all idea to do it, right? Miss, look, come on, Miss Riddle. Yes, when we implemented the bill that Representative Pringle passed in 19, I think we tried to implement it. We had a lot of CPA firms calling us or small town mayors that said, hey, this applies to us, but to get an audit conducted, it's going to be ten to $20,000. I only collect 30000 in revenue. And so we started looking, and Georgia does it this way. When you collect below $100,000, there's these agreed-upon procedures issued by our department, so we kind of have a control over what they're looking at, but then the CPA firms can go do an abbreviated audit for these teeny municipalities that maybe don't have the resources to spend. Okay, so it's, so it's, so it's cost saving. Yeah, but there's still standards, though. It's not just a standardless deal. It's, uh, I mean, even if it's less than 100000 you you're still going to have to um, go by the generally accepted auditing standards. And there, um, there would, they would have to do proof and reconciliations, uh, confirmations of cash balances. There's even a report of motor fuel and excise taxes collected and how they're spent. So it's not just a simple we made this we spent this you, you still got to go through some some standards some verifiable numbers that's right do we have any additional questions from members of the committee do i have a motion i will get a favor report mr rogers made a motion favorable report i second. i'll second mr lawrence second it all in favor of giving house bill 256 a favorable report say aye aye, aye. all opposed ayes have it and the hb 256 is given a favorable report SB 174 by Senator Orr. Um, Mr. Garrett, isn't this identical to the bill of yours we passed? It absolutely is. That's what I thought. So it's uh, HB 211. Uh, we updated the procurement code last year. Yeah. It takes effect October of this year. This makes some technical changes um, before the law actually takes effect. But it's the same exact same one same of yours we passed. Right. Do we have any questions? All of them, do I have a motion? Mr. Shiver, give the bill a favorable report. Do I have a second? Second. By Ms. Hollis. All in favor of giving SB 174 a favorable report, saying say aye. aye. All opposed? SB 174 is given a favorable report. Thank you, Thank Mr. Chair. <clears throat> SB 186 by uh, Senator Hatcher. Yeah. This is identical to this, the bill we passed. Uh, Two weeks ago, the House version. Same yesterday. identical bill, companion bill. Yeah. To HB um, yeah. 250. Yeah, this allows the Alabama Port Authority to build uh, intermodal facilities in other parts of the state using the, the money they, they make. There's no state funds other than what they make. Yes, Mr. Shiver. Do I have a, do any questions? Do I have a motion? I motion, Mr. Chairman. I have a first. I have a second by Shiver. Ms. Hollis, all in favor of giving SB 186 a favorable report, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Ayes have it. All right, thank you. Hard fought battle. SB 190 by Senator McClendon. I'm going to handle this because it's redistricting. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a simple bill that if we are sued in redistricting in state court, all this does is the, the, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court will appoint a three judge panel, much like a three judge federal panel does in federal court. There will be a judge from the Southern District, the Middle District, and the Northern District of the state of Alabama. And their ruling will be able to be appealed directly to the Supreme Court, which will expedite rulings in state court on redistricting and help us resolve the issues faster. So with that. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. On, on, on there, does it, I mean, does it, does the authority then uh, come back to the, uh, to the states that are standing at a, at, a, at a federal level? No, if, if we are being sued in federal court. I know. <laughs> and because of the way that lawsuit works, we go before a three-judge federal panel because it's a 14th Amendment issue. Right. So we automatically get a three-judge federal panel, which, you know, they, they pick three judges. This says that if we're sued in state court, rather than going to a single circuit judge, 
and then have an appeal to the appellate court and then have an appeal to the Supreme Court, we're going to go ahead and appoint a three-judge panel that's, that represents the Southern, the Middle, and the Northern District. And, uh, and it has, where is it? That, yeah, it has the Southern, North. That, that way, uh, any appeal of their ruling will go straight to the Supreme Court, which is where it would wind up anyway. Okay, I, what I'm wondering, you know, I'm gonna, you know, I don't want to take any chance on this uh, redistricting thing because, you know, we, you know, we we get, we got even though we got shortchanged on the thing when we went to the redistricting panel anyway, we went to the Supreme Court. I'm just wondering, is this gonna put another layer, a state layer, in there that you know, on, on redistricting? You know, what, what, you know, and, and a lot of times we know what the state gonna be. We, we win, well, we got to win on federal level anyway. We not gonna win one on state level ever. So well, I, I can I can assure you that federal lawsuit is alive and well right now. I, I know that, but I'm, I'm just, I, I want to. I don't want it. If I'm dead and gone, I don't want to be where we can't get to the state to the. No, this this is, this is no way blocks it. All it says is instead of having a single circuit judge in Montgomery County rule, then have to appeal to an appellate court, and then have to appeal that up to the Supreme Court. The, the 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 chief justice and you read the bill it clearly says it shall the it has the language of inclusion on this three judge federal this three judge panel the language of inclusion is in this bill we'll just have three judges one from the southern middle and northern districts they will make a ruling and if that ruling is appealed it goes straight to the the state supreme court it, it it doesn't deny access to anything it just expedites it and keeps it from languishing around what what a word about it is that used to be when it when it, when it went to the three judge panel and when it, I mean this time uh, well well we it uses a, a slam dunk it's gonna be changed but this time you know uh uh we didn't have enough people on the uh, you usually under the three judge when the three judge panel said look we want to change this thing it changed but this time the uh, our attorney appealed directly to the Supreme Court and which caused it for, I mean I mean we just put another I want to put another another hitch in there instead of just going straight everything is appealable to the Supreme Court I know it is but we they usually don't we never went there before because I guess over here the advantage of the Supreme uh, Court. I, I can assure you the state of Alabama has been to the United States Supreme Court on redistricting <laughs> 1964 Reynolds v Sullivan that is the landmark lawsuit the landmark case it originated in the state of Alabama and it was the one that created the entire concept of one man, one vote representation. I just didn't want to put another, another, no. another. Well, what we're doing is we're eliminating a step. We're making it more efficient. Yes, Mr. Stathay. Wait. I have a motion. Yes, Ms. Boyd. I would like, for the record, to recall I abstain on this issue. Okay. That's, that's fine. We have a motion by Mr. Stathay to give the bill a favor report. I have a second. I have a second by Mr. Keel. All in favor of giving uh, I, I, I want a roll call, but I want, I want to be able to vote. No roll call. Okay. A roll, roll call has been asked roll. for Senate Bill 190. The clerk will call the roll. Represent Pringle? Aye. Represent Sells? Represent Rogers? No. Represent Allman? Represent Ball? <laughs> Represent Betzel? Aye. Represent Boyd? Abstain. Represent Easterbrook? Oh, no, we put the same dish in for you. Represent Hollis. Abstain. Abstain. Represent Keel. Aye. Represent Lawrence. No. Represent Shaver. Yes. Represent Sagan. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it, and SB 190 is given a favorable report. Next, we'll have SB 72 by Senator Williams. I believe Ms. Wilcox is going to present the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the recognition and committee. I'm proud to present this bill, SB 72, to the committee. It was sponsored not only by Senator Williams, but by 23 other senators. This is a bill that allows emergency powers to the schools to do purchasing. I guess I can read the exact description. It would allow the local boards of education and any other public education entity that provided meals under the Child Nutrition Program of Alabama State Department of Education during an emergency or unanticipated event affecting public health or safety or causing supply chain disruptions to purchase goods or services related to the program without advertisement or bidding if recommended by the State Department of Education. 
Do we have any questions from the committee? Yeah. Yes, Ms. Boyd. Um, would you go back for me um, and just repeat the first thing you said that? Well, I can paraphrase that during this most latest uh, COVID crisis and supply chain difficulties, we had problems in feeding the kids. So this is a bill to allow us once the State Department of Education gives notice that there's an emergency situation, then the boards of education do an emergency purchase and not have to go through the bid process, but only during the declared emergency purchase. Wow. Feed the children. Yeah, that's fine, Mr. Rogers. The question is that, you know, uh, we do bid processing in order to make sure, to me, that minority get a fair shot at being involved in in, 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 in getting some of the business. So now you saying to that only this only for food stuff at the, at the, at the school. And it has to be an emergency declared by the State Department what of Education State Department? to give them those powers. Yes, Ms. Boyd. What is the definition of an emergency? Is it defined clearly in the bill? But I guess you can't do away with subjectivity. Well, on page two, line 23, it says, during an emergency or unanticipated event affecting public health or safety causing a supply chain disruption and upon the recommendation of the state superintendent of education and approval of the Department of Examiners of Public Accounts, any city or county or board of education that provides the meals may purchase goods or service related to the program without advertising or bid, only in those special circumstances. And then it further goes on to say that there'll be a further accounting of that as well. Could somebody from Department of Revenue please put that a little bit more in language? In language? Examiner of Public Accounts. Come on, Ms. Riddle. Please come to the microphone. Yeah, thank you. So what happened during COVID is we obviously audit the school boards, the local school boards, and they were calling us and saying we can't get the food from the warehouses okay. and so what we said to them is there's no provision in the law I'm sorry when we come in and audit you we're gonna have to tell you that you broke the law and so they said how do we fix this and we said you have to change the law and they um, I think it was Senator Elliott and Senator Williams talked to me and they wanted the State Department to say there was an emergency but then they wanted some form of oversight by the legislature. So they have to certify that to me. And then I make the decision. All right, three words in there. Mm -hmm. Make me relate. Get the food from the warehouse that I've been a part of. And that's fine. I got it. OK. okay. I mean, simply put, the, the big distributors couldn't get food to our schools to feed children. This allows, us in, an, in an emergency, they can go to Sam's and buy some food to feed the kids. Got it. Not go to jail for doing it. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I understand what I'm trying to do, but I'm going to put a minute here on the floor that this can no way be used to circumvent the uh, process of allowing minority vendors to get a chance mm -hmm. at, at bidding on bidding on it. Yeah. I'm going to put that minute. I can put it on now. I put it on on the floor. I, I think yeah. you, you know what I'm saying. Normally, what I'm getting I, at, don't you? I do. I do understand what you're saying, and in my head, but I know. I won't be here forever. It would be very, very limited circumstances. And so when I'm not the one approving it, I do agree that maybe some of that language maybe should be tightened up a little bit. And we'll be glad to help you write an amendment to do some of that. Okay, we'll get it prepared for when it come on the floor because we're going we're gonna to do it on the floor if you if think it. I won't give you a chance okay. to do it, but you know where I'm coming from. Okay, okay. I was. I meant it's not my bill. <laughs> okay, okay, but it should be in there where, where do you, you see it. But I'll be happy to get it in a way like you're talking about. I totally understand what you're okay. saying. Okay, okay. Thank you. I can assure you from talking to people in the food service industry, there is nothing more wasteful and abusive and stolen than that money we, we put out to feed children. People in the food service industry talk about how despicable it is to see the waste and, and the theft coming out of those cafeterias. But All right, do we have a motion on SB 72? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna stay here right now myself because I'm gonna make the amendment on the floor to do this. Uh, we can make it now because uh, I'm gonna make that amendment on the floor. So you, you understand where I'm coming from? Yeah. yeah. But I'm gonna stay on. All the, right. On I the have floor. a motion by, by uh, 
Mr. Esterbrook to give the bill a favorable report, seconded by Mr. Bedsole. All in favor of giving SB 72 a favorable report, say aye. aye. All opposed? SB 72 is given a favorable report. Thank you. HB 304, we had a public hearing on this bill last week by Mr. Baker. I think we've all heard. Does anybody, committee member, have a question on HB 304 from the public hearing last week? Oh. Uh, yes, Miss Boyd. I was not here last week. Can you just bring me up to speed? Yep. Because I'm from an area. Certainly, certainly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, this is legislation. This is a solid waste landfill permit clarification uh, that's part of this bill. Uh, the, le the legislation provides non-substantive technical revisions uh, to existing law. Uh, the bill does uh, clarify uh, that the local governing body of a county or municipality is not required to approve by vote each and every technical revision made during the ADM permitting process after the initial approval. So uh, uh, it's where this, and um, Dr. Boyd, this goes back to, uh, I guess when I presented for the committee before, and this was that I was part of a, actually I chaired a solid waste management um, task force under the Bentley administration. Uh, there would have been some issues that this goes all the way back to around 2009, 2010 uh, regarding a landfill in Connecticut County and, and such. And there was a moratorium back in, in subsequent years, back in around 2011 and 2012 and such. But anyways, this goes back to 2017 that, uh, that we did have a solid waste management task force. Out of that came legislation in 2017 uh, refining the process uh, to make sure that there was public input uh, was a strong part of that along with other revisions to that. Uh, so the first step in the process is local approval. That's by the municipality or the county. And that includes uh, the site as well. And so uh, as it now progresses, advances, it then goes to, AD, if approved at the local level, that's, that site, and that's, that's including any of the socioeconomic then factors that are part of the location, uh, it then would go to ADEM. ADEM would have a more technical look at the bill and make uh, any uh, revisions regarding technical revisions that would be part of that. Uh, for that to come back to the local government each time that there's a technical revision would be very cumbersome, very costly, and so this is to clarify that it's not to go back once there's been that initial approval by the local entity. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. I have an emotional issue with solid waste and ADEM. I'm from Calhoun County, Anniston, Alabama where AGM lied to us over 25 years with PCBs. I have people in my family and other people. I have no incompetence, and I'm probably just one. Just because, as normally, you dump all that stuff in minority communities where you think anybody will never know. And for 25 years, for well, ADM to did what it did to Calhoun County, in not putting regulations on people. That is hard for me to sit up in here and hear anything about solid waste management and agree with it. I've had people in my family, but the lie is what I'm getting to. Does this bill guarantee what? I guess I just this, this, clar to. this clarifies on the permitting process. Now, I don't know if you, I mean, how you might have voted back in 2017 when I presented legislation that came out of that committee and such, and it was rather broad, some of the changes. There were some changes where originally it went through this, the, the um, uh, regional planning commissions was a step in that. That got completely eradicated, eliminated as a second step in the process. It was felt that was more of a ghost process, more of a cover process that really was not... Uh, uh, something that had substance to it, and so that was removed in the process. But anyway, I'm saying that to say that we did make some, some revisions trying to look holistic at this process, including what you've mentioned there. And so there was a strong emphasis, particularly at the local level, that the local people have an opportunity to express uh, comments and anything in regards to a potential proposed site for a landfill uh, on that. And then it's up to those local authorities to make those decisions. So that's what really what this is about, is trying to clean it up so it clarifies uh, in regards to the permitting process that it doesn't have to return back to the local uh, for technical revisions made by ADEM.
Yes, Mr. Rogers. Uh, the um, what, what you say, uh, Alan? This is that. I'm just gonna say say Justin County, Birmingham. And, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a home. I mean, it means the city council and the mayor then has the authority to decide whether or not they're gonna approve or disapprove uh, 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 another solid, another dump site. Dump site. That is correct. Perm a permit, right? So, so in consideration of a permit, uh, uh, that would go before the local governing entity, whether it be a municipality or a county government. That's correct. Okay. And what, so, ADM then, what, what power ADM will have have then? ADM, I mean, the ADM is on the back end of that because if it now if it doesn't meet the mo it does not meet the local approval. That's first step in process. Then ADM doesn't even have a shot at it. Okay, so so in other words, the, the mayor and city council who respond to the people going to have a, have, have their head, so the people can get back at them if they if they mess up, right? Well, uh, best I can phrase it is once again the, the authority begins with the local entity government governing entities, whether it be municipality or whether it be a county government. So it begins with them on the process. If they have not then given that approval, then then the permit then does not advance to to ADM. Okay. Yeah. One more. Yes, Ms. Boyd. What, in your bill, EPA, what level or how does EPA fit in there, if at all? As I understand, EPA would come in more with the ADEM in regards to their requirements underneath the federal government, both state and federal, I mean, guidelines and provisions, policies, and from the federal government as well as from the state. So that's where it kicks in in regards to more the technical. So whether that's in regards to other specifications such as like the uh, thickness of a liner or other types of parameters might be part of a landfill. Do we have any more questions from members of the committee? Do we have a motion on HP 304? Motion by Mr. Shiver to give the bill a favorable report. Second. Uh, Mr. Bedslow, actually, you know, we don't need seconds. I'm just used to saying that. But under the new rules, there's no second needed. With that, we have a motion to give HB 304 a favorable report. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? Ayes have it. HB 304 is given a favorable report. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. And I do greatly appreciate the comments were made here regarding of, of, of that is locals being greatly involved in the process. Thank you so much. Now before us is a little old bill that hasn't drawn much attention. HB 312 by Mr. Oliver. I believe you have an amendment. Mr. Keel has the amendment. If uh, you'll explain your bill, Mr. Oliver, and, and I'll have Mr. Keel explain the uh, amendment. Without going through the, the entire uh, bill again, I would like to say that it is uh, divisive concepts bill uh, and it is based solely on uh, freedom of speech first amendment uh, preventing uh, people from compelling others to say things they don't believe uh, there are several things that it does not do that I'm after meeting last week I, I'm glad to share with you uh, the bill will not stop teachers from teaching about American history good or bad uh, it won't stop teachers from teaching that racism exists or it won't stop black history classes. Uh, it just won't have these effects. Its aim is not to change any of the areas that are, that are taught now, but to stop the introduction of uh, a new ideologies that use some uh, new teaching methods of teaching children. And it's done at the expense of our children basically for political reasons. And that's what we're trying to prevent. We're looking for fairness and balance. Uh, okay. The concepts that we talk about, it only prohibits the very extreme divisive concepts listed in the bill. And if you read, read the bill, you, you see that the concepts it seeks to stop are very extreme. Uh, they're not part of most instruction about racism or black history because these concepts are not facts. And anyway, they're opinions. Uh, the following are some of the concepts we hope to keep out of the schools in Alabama. That any, in, any individual based solely on race or sex is inherently or automatically racist, sexist, or oppressive. That members of one race should attempt to teach others differently solely on their basis of race, sex, or religion. That fault, blame, or bias should be assigned to others solely on the basis of their uh, race, sex, or religion. 
Uh, here in these, if you just weigh this in the in from K-12, which is a little different than state employees uh, or from higher education, uh, as legislators, we have oversight of K-12. Uh, because we have compulsory education and it's publicly funded, anytime you have a curriculum that is designed at the local school, it's designed by a com uh, combination of local school boards, state school boards, and the legislature. We as a legislature actually have and should have oversight of what curriculum is. Mm -hmm. This is an attempt to teach uh, in a fair and balanced way and to, to have the, uh, I think we should be in the dogged pursuit of the truth. So we're trying to keep bias out of schools. We're trying to teach fairly. Now, I have an amendment if anybody would. Uh, All right, we're, we're going to get to that. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hollis, I believe you have a question. Mm -hmm. I have several questions. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I have several questions. Sure. And I'm still confused on your definition of deceptive, dece divisive concept. And I heard you talk about fair and balance. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm also trying to process what is the actual purpose of this bill? Exactly what I said. Fair and balanced. And if you read the concepts, you can't, they're not refutable. Now, I will say the amendment does take care of a couple of the things that you did not like last time. And so when you talk about, what, what, when you talk about black history, tell me what is it that you know about black history? Doesn't matter what I know about black history. It does matter. You write no. the bill, you're the sponsor. No, this it, it, it matters. It does it matter. Does. So you don't know anything about black history is what you're saying. No, I didn't say that. Yeah, that's I, what you said. What that's you what I received. The, so basically, I basically, I have the floor, Representative. So basically, what you're saying is, and you don't understand that omission of history is that is is a d divisive concept. You know, not being. I understand a, being, that, that that is an issue. You still interrupted me, Representative. I have the floor. My apologies. Thank you. Uh, also, you talk about what is it that is, I, I just feel that it's something that is being hidden that you don't want to be told. Uh, uh, is it about the brutality of slavery that was in the day, the difference between a house slave and a field slave and the brutality that they had to go through? Is that what, is, I'm, I'm just still trying to no, understand. Purpose. I'm still, you keep interrupting me. Sorry. I'm just trying to get an understanding of your bill because I'm telling you what I'm getting from your bill. Whether we agree or disagree, you're going to still know how I feel about this bill. And, and I just think that and if, if teachers already have a curriculum, so is, would this not be redundant to what they are already doing? So I'm just trying to understand what is it, you know, other than putting burns on teachers, uh, uh, well, they got to be nervous about what they teach someone or they're going to be sued or, or what. I'm just trying to get an understanding of your bill because I, I already know that you don't know black history. You just told me that. So I'm trying to understand, you know, because I remember when I was in high school uh, and I went to, it was only 10% black people in at the high school that I attended. And our black history was we learned about Martin Luther King, Rosa Carr, and, and George Washington Carver, that was it. We didn't, I didn't understand a lot of black history until I got to college. So that's what I was taught, you know, within the home. So I'm, I'm trying to understand what is it that you're trying to do or what you're trying to provide or, or what's the purpose of this bill. And, you know, you're making me feel like we're going to have to start renting little places where we could teach our children history because the teachers are afraid to teach. You know, so that's that's why I just want to full understand. I, I know you read from that paper, but you're still not giving me the definition, your definition of divisive concept. And I'm gonna let somebody else talk because I, I think I'm gonna have to come back before this. This we might we might miss session today, Mr. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Uh, let's let's do this because I know well, this. I Mr. Answer. Chair. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm glad to. And I, I know I want to know your definition. Divisive concepts are discriminatory concepts. Okay. If you read those, they're obviously on their face discriminatory. There are two that we put in that we're going to eliminate by amendment, which they do exactly what we're trying to prevent. If you look at J and K on the the bill, I uh, read the bill. Okay, the J and K we're eliminating for that reason. 
They are absolute truth. They're finite. They're things that we cannot argue with. So what is the purpose of this bill? Yes, the, sir. The purpose of the bill, and that's a good point, uh, teaching methodology, pedagogy, the way you teach students. We want to make sure that, that the The folks, way you teach students. Yes. The way you, you teach see an students. Yes. You explain the way you teach students. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of different ideologies and methodologies that some people would like for your kids to learn. There are a lot of people so in Alabama so that so would that's, not appreciate that's it. That's it right there. Is certain topics you want kids to learn. You don't want them to know everything. What you just said earlier, you want them to know the good and the bad. But you just said the way that you teach students and what you teach students. With all due respect, what I am trying to do is protect students in this state. Protect them from? From different ideologies that I do not think are appropriate. Like? Like socialism and communism or anything else. Can you go more in detail? Uh, how much detail do you want? Oh, I'm, you ain't giving me anything. I'm trying to understand. You, I'm, I'm asking you what you're telling me. What I'm telling you is that I believe that mm -hmm. there are people who would like to proselytize our children. Who are the people? Uh, any number of groups. Like? You have communists, you have socialists, you have... And they're teaching what? I need an example, because I'm, I'm really trying to understand your bill, sir. Well, you have complaints that have come from several schools in this state as well as many others. And, and I don't want to go into all that because I, I mean, why not? It. Because this is what we're it's, talking no, it's about. It's not anecdotal. This is to prevent something from happening. Okay, you Regardless still have not caught. You still not have explained to me what you are trying to prevent, and that's what I'm trying I to am understand. Trying to prevent compelled speech. For example, a teacher that tells some little kid that, uh, in the the roughest way, I know to say it that he should be a Marxist because, and gives a great example of, of why that child should be a Marxist. I don't believe that. I don't want my children to believe that. I don't want the teacher to be teaching that. Is, is that a good example? No, because mm -mm, you you're not saying what your bill is saying, sir. That's exactly what the bill's for. That's its intent, and that's why we have it. Well, I'm, I'm gonna let somebody else talk. Yes, Ms. Boyd. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, are you an educator? I am not. All right. You can stop right there. <laughs> In your bill where it says restricted and what people are taught can have a spillover effect, I just stop and won't do the rest. It went deeply with me when you talk about curriculum. Why? I have an earned master's in curriculum and supervision and I earn doctorate in reading and instructional leadership. All this, I don't want to use the word I want to use, crap on this paper, that's been done by a curriculum that you go through the state. If you want changes in that, you go to the state board, you go through a different process. Why are we dealing with this crap? I am sorry, audience. Why are we dealing with this on paper, which nobody probably had real knowledge. There's a hidden agenda here for this whole thing to control what is being taught and all this other junk out there that always been for minorities, not just blacks alone. Watch what's happening in the climate. There are five groups of minorities. This is an insult to me and anybody else who sits out there who really know what education is about and curriculum, and I'll rest, because I could sit here and we, to in the morning and go through pieces of this. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity Mr. to Mr. speak. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Ball. Could I speak? Yes, turn your microphone on. Thank you very much. I've given a lot of thought to this bill and this issue, and quite frankly, I've seen, I'm so sick of the divisive concepts, and I've seen them over and over again for so long, and it's like we just keep going through the same, it's like Groundhog Day over and over again. When my colleague from Birmingham last week, when he mentioned something, at first when he spoke, it rubbed me the wrong way, and then I thought about it, and I thought he's telling the truth. You could take this same bill, I spent time in the minority several years 
before before the Republicans took over. And if a Democrat would have, well, let me, first of all, let me say what the gentleman from Birmingham reiterate what he said. He said his problem <laughs> isn't what's in the bill. As a matter of fact, mo what's in the bill is very, very good ideas that b should be encouraged. But they should not be compelled under force of law. This would be a great resolution for what we stand for. I know that the school board, the school board, uh, the state school board addressed this issue with some policy and it was very controversial, but actually that was a good venue to address it. That's what the state, that's what the school boards are for. And one of the problems we get into is this this race issue that's been going on for so long, this is a spiritual issue more than anything. There's and what happens in this in this race issue is the hatred gets thrown out and then it creates contempt and hatred gets sent back and it keeps escalating over time. And what happens is pain, this pain is transmitted. You know, those of us of faith believe that there's a power that can transform faith into something else. But if you keep put, sending it back, this is what you keep getting. And the fact is, a bill like this needs to be bipartisan. It has to be bipartisan to do what it's supposed to do. It's going to, it, it will backfire because you can't address a spiritual problem with a political solution. And that's, and, 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 and it's really what it is. And, um, my whole, my whole point. I mean, my whole point. I understand. Here's what happens in politics: you get, you get each side that they see something somebody does, and the problem with the bill on the opposition is who's bringing it. It's all Republicans that are bringing it, and what happens is in politics is adversarial. So in politics, you see what people on your side do, and you put it in the best possible context. And then you see what people on the other side do, and you put it in the worst possible context. And so something like this, if it's going to heal, it should not be divisive. It should be the spirit that, and, and I'm not saying you're not in the, you know, you're, you mean to do well, but this isn't going to do it because, because the hard work of, of addressing where all this started and where can we go together we haven't gotten there and you can't do it in an adversarial environment you have to do it in a spirit of love and not this side overpowering that side and we got the votes to pass it i know it's it's that that it's it will probably pass if people make their mind up to do it but it's not going to have the desired effect it's going to fail in doing what we want it to fail because what it's going to do, we actually, I'm glad it was introduced because these precepts need to be talked about and we need to have honest dialogue about this. We need to, we need to come together and, and it's hard and sometimes you got to fight a little bit before you make up. But, uh, but I just want us to, to see us make more progress and this ain't getting us there. I mean, not in the form of a, of a law, and like I like I said, I I wish I wish I could make it better, but uh, <clears throat> I can't. And I, I I think we just have to. It's, there's just a lot more work to do before we sh before I believe we should pass a law to compel this. But thank you very much. And thank you for for stating that. But I do believe this is the only way. Uh, and I do believe that it has to be bipartisan, and I hope that in the long run that it is. Not going to happen. <laughs> Mr. Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, I have several questions and comments on, on this particular piece of legislation, but I'll start here. Um, <clears throat> first of all, on your bill, let's start with page one, lines 13 through 16. And I'll read what it actually says. 
It says this bill would prohibit the state from teaching or training employees, contractors, teachers, or students to adopt or believe certain concepts regarding race, sex, or religion. Now I want to put this into kind of some practical terms or practical examples. Um, last year, the Coleman County School System had to respond to an incident where white students were um, circulating a racist video, okay? And in that, the school system had to create rules or policies in place to first show how this was racism and white supremacy. In your bill, would that, would your bill prohibit that from happening moving forward? Say the last part of that again, please, sir. Okay. The school system adopted in Coleman County last year once the video was surfaced about um, racist antics toward blacks, okay? They adopted policies and corrective actions involving educating people about racism and white supremacy that exist today. With this example, would your bill prohibit that from happening? No, that would not prohibit that as long as it didn't violate any of those divisive concepts. And I don't think there's very many circumstances that it would. So how can you, how could you talk about race and racism without explaining what it really is? There's no way. You can talk about racism. Let me let me give you let me give you an example of what I consider a divisive concept. Um, this is Kelvin Lawrence, Representative Kelvin Lawrence definition of a divisive concept. When we create different pieces of legislation like permitless carry dividing police officers against each other. To me, that's a divisive concept. When we have an opportunity in the state of Alabama to accept 95 to 90% to 95% of Medicaid expansion for poor people in the state of Alabama and we choose not to, to me, that's a divisive concept. When we create bills that prohibit the freedom of speech from a quote unquote small government, anti-government body of legislators that prohibits the speech from other people, to me, that's a divisive concept. And last but not least, as we sit here today and we talk about all of these bills and we talk about everything that has happened, from Kelvin Lawrence's perspective, and I think a lot of people would agree with me, House Bill 312 on its face is a divisive concept. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Keel, would you uh, like to explain your amendment to HB 312? Yes, sir. Uh, the amendment largely is uh, <coughs> pertaining to page four and it's the last two definitions of what might be described as a divisive concept, and it removes the last two, which are uh, that meritocracy or traits such as hard work, ethics, or racist or sexist. It also removes that with respect to American values, slavery and racism are anything other than deviations from, betrayals of, or failures to live up to the founding principles of the United States, which include liberty and equality. Uh, the remainder deals with uh, a school not losing accreditation and uh, the dis any disciplinary action would have to go through the, the normal procedures. So you're removing <coughs> section J and K in their entirety on page four? Yes, it's yes, lines sir. five through 10. And then your other part on page seven, line 25. No, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Page seven, line four. That's right. After from. That's right. Insert the following language. 
It'll, it'll, it'll then read, public institutions of higher education from providing any instructional or furtherance of satisfying any accreditation standard or. That's correct. Or discussing any diverse concept. Well, nothing in this act shall be construed okay. to prohibit a public institution yeah. of higher education from, and then insert the wording, providing any instruction and furtherance of satisfying, satisfying any, any accreditation standard. Or prohibit a public instance, or prohibit discussing, or discussing any divisive, divisive concept in the sub in the majority. That's already manner. in there. That, yes, yeah, sir. Right. I, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm reading what it inserts into it. And on page seven, line twenty-five. So at the bottom of the page, on page seven, line twenty-five, after the first word "act," insert the following language: Any disciplinary action or termination of an employee of a public institution of higher education shall remain subject to relevant policies established by the institution. And so, in the in the the original body of the bill, it dealt with K twelve, but not higher ed specifically. And so, it, it allows the higher ed to uh, that they must remain subject to the relevant policies established by the institution. Are there any questions on the amendment? Mr. Stathag? To adopt the amendment? Mr. Chairman, before we yeah. get there. Uh, the, you know, I don't, I don't <coughs> doubt that, let me just say this, let me get it very clear. I don't, I don't doubt that you got good intentions. You know, I, we've talked about this over and over. But this is the wrong venue to use this right, right now because of the fact that uh, it's so much misunderstanding about the uh, about the about the concept right now. It's, uh, it's, uh, personally, I think that uh, uh, if something happened in history uh, down the line, it ought to be taught. I don't have no problem with that. I, I, I think, but I mean, you you can go to Oklahoma, you can go to what happened in, in Alabama, what happened before the the uh, thing. But it, I mean. All that could go on, but what I'm saying to you is that is that this is the wrong venue to use right now because the CRT is that's what it is. It's so divisive right now that to put this on the floor right now would be like putting a poison pill <laughs> in, a, in, in a in a young. If something happened in history, and I, I've said it over and over. If something happened in Oklahoma, the uh, the uh, where they kill all those black folks, Brown uh, uh, and I mean, that would be tough. But with the idea is that you want to, they, they said you don't want certain thing taught because you don't think that your child ought to know everything that happened back in history for this, so and <coughs> you want them to be criticized. That's, that's where I get the concept about being hated in school, that, 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 that's not the issue. The issue is this, is that when you don't tell the whole truth about it, something, you always leave something hidden. So, so, so therefore, I, I really feel personally that what you're trying to do is whitewash the whole issue. You try, you, you're trying to clean up something that you can't clean up, but I understand it to me. I, I mean, I, I have no doubt that if, it, if this came out the house, it, it, the senator would jump on it with five red feet. And so, I, so, so I'm just being honest with you. So I, I don't think I think we ought to carry this over and and, and leave it where it is. I, I know. I mean, I'm hoping that you, in your heart you got a concept, but I think you got a, a good heart. I, I don't think you mean to be divisive, but this bill be so divisive right now. It's like a like a poison pill right now to to a lot of people, and I think I think that and I'm seeing it this way is, is that is that people with where I understand it that you don't want your child to be criticized for what happened in, in back in history, but you know and get and get the brunt of it. But if you understood, you young folks are not crazy. They understand what's going on, and I think I think that. If something happened, they ought to know about it. I don't think that we, we I mean, I'm not the kind of person, I'm sure all of us of color are not the kind of that's going to attack someone because what happened. We just want folks to know what really happened in, in reality. I, I want my kids to know, I mean, I was brought up in a Catholic school. I didn't get all this stuff. But when I found out what happened in Oklahoma, 
It bothered me. I think your child ought to understand what it did in Oklahoma, what it did in Alabama, when it, when when we had Black Wall Street and then and then it got abolished. To us, this is a racial issue. To us, and we see it. We see it different from different eyes from where you see it, or Mr. Pringle see it, or anybody else on his panel see it. Because we lived it. We actually lived it. I did anyway. I, I, I was there when I saw this stuff. And, 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 and to think that we are going to go punish another in child in school learning this stuff is going to be detrimental is wrong. But they ought to know. I mean, we not actually, I mean, I mean, I'm gonna say it like this. They give reparations to the Japanese. <laughs> they give to everybody else. But we actually built this country. I mean, earlier talked about the peanut butter. We we just we have folks like uh, uh, getting blood plasma, all that kind of stuff. Black folks. I mean, we built the White House with our own hands. The White House in Washington, black folk built that thing. So therefore, this kind of thing is not ready to be done right now. And I wish that we just carry this bill over. I'm not uh, and leave it where it is. And 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 uh, if you want to teach critical race theory, CRT, let's teach it. Let's do it and do it right. Let's sit down and plan how to do it right. But this is not the right time to do this thing right now. Miss Hollis. I do agree with uh, Representative Rogers and uh, Representative Oliver and, and, and my colleagues here. I do want you to know that HB 312 is offensive. It's, it's very offensive. And, and I, I, and I want to ask you all, the question is, wouldn't you be concerned if you were uh, told that you had to restrict your speech and conversation and, and that and, and, and that you would be punished by the government based on something that you said. I just want you to think about that. And, and I, I'm trying to keep everything nicety, you know, and I guess what I better, I, be, I better hold back and just say that this bill, and I want you guys to know and lays that it's offensive, it's offensive. And I think that we really need to go back, and if you want this to be a bipartisan bill, let's make it that. Because if we're telling you the feelings of other people, then I'm, I'm asking you to listen. I'm asking you to listen. Because this, this bill right here is, 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 is gonna start mo more division amongst people. Is is um is is going to start. The teaching is not going to stop. Let me say that it's not going to stop. And eventually, what you trying to stop other kids from knowing, they're going to find out. They're going to find out. But I think that if you really want to make it a bipartisan bill for everyone and for things to be right. You know, let's do that, but not with this bill, because that's not that's is it is not the 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 road that is going on for what you're trying to do. Thank you, Ms. Hollis. And ladies and gentlemen, we have a motion on the floor. Do all in favor of adopting the amendment, say aye. aye. All opposed. Uh, I don't want to adopt anything on this bill right now. I right, so we have the ayes have it. The amendment's adopted to. HB 312, do I have a motion to give the bill a favorable report as amended? Yeah, you want a roll call? Do I have a motion to give the bill a favorable nobody, report? Nobody, nobody give it a favorable report yet. Oh, anybody move to give it a favorable report yet? I haven't heard anybody say it the same way. Well. Mr. Eastbrook, do you want to make a motion to give the bill a favorable report as amendment? Uh, we have a motion to give the bill a favorable report. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, to, uh, he, nobody made a motion to give a favorable report, and you asked him to give a favorable report. He, he raised his hand up. I didn't see him raise his hand. Well, I did. Nobody gave a bill a favorable report. Yeah, I said, 
and he raised his hand, and I looked over and said, "Does that mean you want to give a bill? For, do you want to make a motion, Mr. Well, Brooklyn? I, I, I move yes. you. I move not to give a bill made before. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Please talk in your microphone. Turn on. There are people watching. Teaching history as it occurred, the good, the bad, or the ugly. I can't find it in it, anywhere in here. And I hear what uh, the other people say, and, and I agree with a lot of it. But when I read these, can you tell me which one you would want to be taught of these that, you know, for somebody's child to be taught? I see it the opposite. I, I mean, when I read the first one, is there anybody here that believes that uh, a child should be taught that one race, sex, religion are inherently superior to another race? I wouldn't think so. Go to the next one. This is a state, the United States, it's inherently racist. It's not, the state is not, or the United States, there are people that are. And, and, always, and it will be. Trying to overturn an election. That an individual solely by virtue of his or her sex or race is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive. Every individual makes up their own mind, right? No. Or at least I think. Politics and party. That an individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely based on his or her race. That's what we've lived in the past. Isn't that what we're trying to stop? Who lived in the past? The people here. I, I don't think you get it either. But uh, I point of order, uh, Mr. Asking. Chair, I think Mr. Rogers had a, uh, a motion on the floor. To no. we, had a, we had a motion to give the bill a favorable report as amendment by Mr. Easterbrook first, and then we had a motion by Mr. Rogers. So uh, we had a well, no, we had a motion by Mr. Easterbrook first, then we had a motion by Mr. Rogers. So we have two motions on the floor. All, you, Mr. Rogers, your motion is to carry yeah, the bill carry over. Bill over and give it for report carry it over. All in favor of carrying the bill over, say aye. Yes, aye. Oh, wait, 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 Mr. Easterbrook, what? If we carry this over, can I would like for them to sit down and, and work with them. To, to, yes. Because I, I think I there's have, a lot of good I here. I have no problem with that. To make it a bipartisan bill, let's do that. Yeah, but if you have people that's telling you how they feel, Representative Easterbrook, then you should listen. This is going to create more problems. We already have problems, and I'm tired of problems. I'm sorry. tired of racism. I'm tired of this shit. Excuse me. Oh, 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 but I am tired oh, yeah. of it, and it is okay. unnecessary. It's and if right. it's something that we can come together to do, then that's what we should do. All right, we have a motion to carry this bill over. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Ayes have the bills carried over. Thank you. We are adjourned. I still can't read it and see a thing in there of what I hear. Not one thing. I read the opposite.